Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Ted Stewart. Um, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and adjust your speaker volume, mute your microphones. We're going to get started today. Hey, thank you so much for or taking the time out of your, your uh, busy day. Uh, we got a great attendance. So I'm very excited about that. And today's webinar is going to be kind of fun. It's, it's something we don't get to do a lot, but uh, we're really going to share with you uh, why we're doing so well, how we're changing uh, the functional safety and cybersecurity industry. And, and really what we're doing is we're putting a lot of pressure on the other um, competitors or other uh, people and companies in this industry because we want to make sure that people are doing more than less, right? We want to make sure that we're keeping the bar high and we're continuing to do so. And that's what we're going to discuss today and share with you is, is what we're doing, what are the, the latest things that we've been working on and why we keep raising this bar so that we can keep people safer um, and not just kind of uh, do what everyone else is doing and, 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 and you know, settling, right? So my name is Ted Stewart. I'm the Program Development Compliance Manager for Exeda. I've been with Exeda for about six years now. Uh, time's flying. Uh, before that, just a quick background on myself. Uh, I started off with Lockheed Martin in Missiles and Fire Control out of Orlando in Florida. Uh, a lot of fun there, learned a lot, but I was pretty early in my career. I then went over to a sister company called Harris Corporation. With Harris Corporation, we got to work with Wilder's Products Group. They call themselves WPG. Uh, it's a it's a smaller division of Harris, and we basically made these little black boxes that could locate and track people. <laughs> it was pretty cool, and uh, we we needed different types of clearances to do that. Uh, my role is there. I I um helped with 14 different classified products, where literally the lifespan of that product was a year, maybe two tops, uh, but it was a very fast product. So you had to develop it, execute it, get it out in the field, and it was you already had to start working on the next product because of how quickly technology changes um, within that industry. Uh, then I was lucky enough to have found Exida. I, I made that transition from sunny Florida to Pennsylvania, and I'm gonna share with you something that uh, I saved, I have a file of it, but it's the reason why I actually started working for Exida. Um, I was interviewed by Dr. Bill Goble. It was like a four to six hour interview and it was it was pretty powerful. And, and listening to how and why uh, Dr. Goble started this company was uh, pretty unique. And so I have, a, I have an audio file of that that I'm gonna share with you today. Um, but you know, before I jump right into this presentation, I do want to share some of the slides sharing, you know, showing you our progress, and then I'll, I'll jump right into why we're having so much success uh, and why we're, we're doing as well as we are. And then at the end, what I want everyone to start thinking about now is start thinking about those questions. If you have any other ideas or other kind of improvements that you'd like to see us do or, or do some research on, now is your time to ask those questions um, because normally we, we really just deal with our advisory board and they're usually the ones sharing their ideas, telling us what we need to be doing, how can we improve, how can we become better, what are they seeing in the field? Uh, but on this webinar, I'd like to see if you wouldn't mind also sharing sharing that with us. Um, at Excel, I'm responsible for a lot of new product developments, right? So 61508 is for OEM functional safety, uh, end user functional safety. You can see 62443 is cybersecurity, automotive is 26262. Uh, we also, I also help with machinery, robotics, and railway. Uh, another thing about myself, uh, when I'm not working, uh, and, and mind you, we're a global company, so you kind of work around the clock, but whenever we get time, my wife and I, we love um, cycling. I'm an avid cyclist, and then also we love home renovations. Uh, that's just another hobby of mine, so I just thought it could be kind of fun uh, just to share a little bit something about myself. Uh, Exeter, you know, we are a customer focused company. We are the only company that encompasses that complete life cycle of functional safety and cybersecurity. And really, this alone, it, it does make us very unique and it allows us to bring a lot to the table. And as you can see from the diagram on the right here, uh, we have tools, we have life cycle services, we have the assessments and certifications for anything that you would need in your industry for functional safety and cybersecurity. Really neat to see. Uh, we had a report done from ARC, 
and you can see here, it's, it was a 2015 uh, review on us, and it showed that we were that global leader in, in, in safety device certifications. And I'm not gonna lie, when we first saw this, we didn't think we were the top leaders at first. We, we never really paid attention to it. We just kind of put our heads down and ran. Um, so it was really cool to see that in all safety device certifications, we were that leader. And then even when it came to the logic solver, uh, which is the logic solver, why that's important is because that's usually what um, leads the market, right? The logic solver is the one that really, in our industry anyways, and it was nice to see that we owned 46% of that market. Uh, TV Ryan was a close second. Um, but, you know, now, you know, we, I mean, we did have like a, a 10 year, uh, we, we started like around 10 years later, right? With certification. So uh, other companies did have a head start on us, but we quickly caught up and we're, we only see ourselves moving forward. Cybersecurity was a different story. We all started at the same exact time with certifications. And um, yeah, we, this is a fun one. <laughs> uh, we're really doing well. And, and it seems though a lot of our hard work is paying off. And people are truly seeing that, you know, what we're doing and why we're doing and how we're doing these cyber gap assessments um, has really helped them. And the words getting out that our methods and methodologies are, are doing well. So thank you everyone that's that's been a part of us for that for that area. Okay, so here we go. Let's get this this get the, today's webinar started. And really, you know, if you are that technical engineer and you've always wanted you know to work with us, or and what we want to say is, look, this is this webinar today is really for people that know about us, don't know exactly what we do, and they want to know why we're so successful and all the different things that we now do that you really can benefit from. A lot of people, uh, we get a lot of questions from management saying, okay, well, we have all these different quotes, you know, why would we choose you kind of thing? And so that's really what this webinar is going to be for is show you all the latest and greatest information that, that's now out there available for you things that we've discovered, things that you can have at no cost. Like there's a lot of cool stuff that we're doing here to help everyone. Um, like I said, if, if there's a decision maker or a management position, if you're on the call here and you wanna see why our growth is going the way we are, even if you're someone of our competitors, right? We have a lot of people that join these calls. I didn't look at the list prior to this call, but even if you're someone that, you know, we, we share similar services, you can kind of see what we're doing. Um, we, we don't really mind. Uh, from the history of our company, we've always shown a steady growth, even through all the industry setbacks, like the oil and gas sector, right? We're always growing, and there's reasons why we're always growing, and it's because of our advisory board and learning what our companies or what our customers are looking for and what they need um, from us. So what we're going to talk about today is really how, how did it actually get started. We're going to talk about why we're a niche market and why we'll never grow beyond that. Uh, we'll talk about the different company, how it's split up, what type of work we do for OEM and end users. We'll talk about personnel certification. Everything that we do that's unique is what we're going to talk about today. And you know why we're different and what's the reason for our success. All right, so here's the fun part, right? Uh, I'm gonna open up my file here and I wanna share with you, this is something that I've recorded, right? And it's something, he shared, Dr. Goble shared this story with me when I was doing my interview and it was just so powerful. And this is actually one of the reasons why I was like, you know what, this company is someone that I could really learn from. So let me go ahead and play that audio. I hope it works. Hold on one second. Exeter has now been in an existence for almost 20 years. When I think about the beginnings, I think about how we got started. I work for a manufacturing company. We were developing a new safety PLC. We contacted TUV Product Service in Munich, Germany to do the certification for us. A fellow named Reiner Fowler and one of his engineers came over to do the first audit. They went through the standard one sentence at a time, asking us how we did things. We would explain. After two weeks, they said, thank you very much for all your cooperation, but you failed. And I said, why? He says, oh, go read the standard. And I said, I just did. I've been reading it all week. And they said, well, we're not allowed to tell you why you failed. We're not allowed to help our customers. Call us when you're ready for another audit. <laughs> of course, we made the changes we thought would work. They came back and audited again. And they said, you failed. 
same story all over again. And finally, I was very, very frustrated as project manager. I flew over to Munich, Germany and met with Reiner Fowler and said, you've got to do things differently. You got to tell people, you got to explain. And he said, you're right. I'll get back. I'll check with my management and get back to you. Reiner did three or four weeks later or some, some period of time later, Reiner said, look, my management says we're not changing. So why don't you quit your job and I'll quit my job and we'll start a new company to do this properly. And we did. So that's the recording I have. And, and, and for me, I mean, that was so powerful and, and it's really cool that, you know, you, you, when, when you work with a company that your founders, right, are that passionate about something and they found a, a void in the market, they found something that people were struggling with and they solved it. And so it's, it's, you know, it's nice to work with a company where you're now becoming that solution. And <laughs> so when I say that, you know, it's a niche market, it really is a niche market. And anytime a company grows too fast or they start making them, they spread themselves too thin, right? They start getting into other industries because we even know some of our competitors, they're into everything. They're certifying everything. You know, they're doing maybe CE markings and explosion proof and they're, and they're just, they're branching out like crazy. Anytime you spread that wide, you start losing quality, right? And so that's why our founder said, no, look, we're going to stay right here. Yes, we'll, we'll go into different standards, but we're staying right here. We're going to stay into what we know. We know functional safety. We know cybersecurity, right? And then we're staying right here. And, you know, we, we do a lot of principles around that book, Good to Great. And it's really how do we become that great company? And so that's what we do. And we eat, sleep, and repeat, right? And, you know, we're not going to be that company that's a jack of all trades and a master of none. No, we're going to be that master of functional safety, that master of cybersecurity, and we're going to stay right here. We're going to keep that complete supply chain of of, uh, of the life cycle, and we're staying right there. Now, the, the funny part is, and, and so I had to include it, is if this was my chart, you know, eat, sleep, and repeat, because <clears throat> our, our founder, this is what he did. When he goes on vacation, he can't wait to get back to work to start doing this again. And so what I do is I eat, sleep, work, but I eat, eat a little bit more, right? So uh, this is something where uh, when, when there's food in, the, in this office, yes, they bring it to me when there's leftovers and I always eat it. So uh, I just thought that was kind of funny there. Okay, but look, here's the thing. Certification programs, they've been established by private companies and government bodies all over the world. And all organizations who perform certification, they should be accredited for their field of work. OK, and now when you select a third party, these are just three of the ones that I, I could think of quickly here because I, I'm, I'm limited on time. But when you select a partner, you want someone you're trusted with, make sure they're accredited. You know, ask for their credentials, ask for their CVs, ask to see why you should trust them, why they're any better than you. How are they that expert? Because when, here's one reason why you want that accreditation from whoever you're going to be working with is because once you become accredited, for us here, I'll take me, us for example, right? X, we're fully accredited per ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. Uh, it's the United States IEC liaison, and we're accredited for as a certification body for cybersecurity and for functional safety. Now, what's it, what's what's the critical piece of that information is ANSI, though. You know, they're now a member of the International Accreditation Forum. You'll you'll hear them as IAF. Most countries, right, in this world are signatories of the IAF, which is that multilateral recognition agreement. Long story short, essentially, because we're accredited, we now have a global acceptance because we're part of this, this program. Um, and so anyone that's not accredited, you now do not have a global acceptance on the work that they're performing for you. And uh, in that third bullet point, you know, we are the most trusted service provider and it's for good reason. I, I, I my disclaimer here is sorry, I, I couldn't get everyone's logo on there. We did our best. <laughs> we kind of put it in, it, it was just getting really uh, clustered. But um, as you can see here, a lot of trusted service providers and um, we're very happy for that, that we've earned their respect. But it, it, there's good reasons why we've earned their respect. And so global, Globally, you know, we are a global company. We're a consulting company, a certification firm for functional safety, for IACS, cybersecurity, um, industrial automation control system, cybersecurity, alarm management. We have offices all over the world. And every year we're growing. 
And the reason we have these different, uh, lack of a better term, the reason why we have these silos, I should say, these six different uh, divisions is to keep impartiality, right? So we have a group of people at our company that would do end user services. We have a group of people that work with the manufacturers. We have a group of people that develop software. We have another group of people that will do training. And you're, you're gonna learn, or what we'll do is we'll share with you why we have all these different areas, because impartiality is extremely important, especially when you're an accredited company. You need to have these silos in place so that you don't give one of your customers more of an advantage than another, and it's extremely important. Um, but it's also extremely important to share our, our founder's vision, right? Which is when people go along this path and they want help in cybersecurity, they want help in functional safety, they're gonna need assistance along the way. They're, you can't just assume they know everything. And so there's a lot of things that we do now because of our advisory board and from listening to customers uh, like you, is we now do certain things differently that still meet those requirements and still allow us to be accredited that no one else does. The first thing we did is we we have personnel competency programs. Now, when people say, hey, well, CFSC, I mean, who owns the CFSC program? Well, the history, in the, the quick history, is it first started off where uh, a bunch of different companies got together and they formed a, this, this CFSC program. The main players were us and TV Rhineland. Uh, shortly after it was all started, uh, TV Ryland backed out, I, because it was, I don't know, I don't know the reasons I only were told because it was a lot of work and it was not making much money. Okay. That's what I was told. If anyone has a better story, let me know, but they backed out and said, you guys take over. So Exit held on to it and we developed it to what it is today with the help of our advisory board member. And, and I might see one or two, one on here that is advisory board member from CFSC, so thank you so much. But we have advisory board members that are our end user customers and or manufacturers, and they help promote and tell us what we should be looking for and how we should be grading and what specialties we should have out there for people. Okay, so you do know that um, our competitors all went the certificate route, right? You have FSN, FS Expert, ISA Expert, uh, a lot of other things out there. Yeah, and actually does have a certificate program too. We call it FSP or CSP, right? A Functional Safety Practitioner or Cybersecurity Practitioner. What does this mean? So let me quickly, and then we'll go to the next slide. So a certificate program is basically one which you have a training, you go to a training and then you have to pass an exam based on that training. That training is required, all right? When that training is required, it is now a certificate program. And if you, if you pass that exam right, you get the certificate, which is great. And here's the thing, whether it's a certificate or a certification, they're both fantastic. It all depends on what your work is entitled for. So what is your position in the company? Are you supposed to be a leader or a mentor? Then you need more than a certificate. If you're if you're just somebody that deals with functional safety, you just deal with cybersecurity or alarm management or fire and gas, or maybe you do you help with HazOps, right? So you can do a certificate program because you're not expected to be uh, someone running a team of other functional safety uh, professionals or, or experts, right? You you just solely have you just have to be in that realm, right? If you are someone that's a mentor or a leader, you need something more than a certificate. Anyone personally can sit down in a training, listen, right? Stay off their phone, stay off their computer, listen to that training, understands the concepts, ask those questions, stay involved. And at the end, even if I had zero experience going in, I still have an opportunity to pass that exam at the end. And then all of a sudden I have a certificate, right? And I have zero years of experience before then. That's what you need to keep in mind. If you had a certification, there is no training that's required. You go in and it's kind of like a PE for engineers. You go in, it's open book. You have no idea what questions are going to be asked and you have to go through your time and you have to pass that exam. That is what uh, we felt sets the bar as a gold standard. That's why it's known as a gold standard, but there's a functional safety one for certifications and also a cybersecurity one. So I know a lot of people are taking the route of certificates right now in cybersecurity, which is great, right? Become that CSP, become, if you want to do the, the ISA expert or whatever that you, you take like four training classes, do that route, but once once you're ready to become a, a leader or a mentor, you need to do a certification. All right, the next thing. Okay, we talked about people. Now let's talk about the services of products and for end users and manufacturers. 
what's unique about our company? Now, when we first got started, we weren't an a la carte service, right? End user, yeah, we, we normally were where whatever they needed within the life cycle, if we wanted to come into a plant, we would say, okay, wh where are your sore, sore, sore points? Do you need some type of assessment? Do you need us to do uh, uh, a HARA? Do you need us to review sill verifications? What do you need us to do, right? And we would do it in end years. Manufacturer side, it was more so people would come to us and say, hey, I have a sill, I need a sill two product. I need a sill three product. I have a transmitter, I have a valve. You know, what, what we need to figure out so that we can sell these products to an end user. So we would do basically a turnkey service where we'd say, okay, uh, we, we're gonna ask for some documents. We're gonna tell you there's some action items, resolve those action items and you're good to go, and we'll get your failure rates, right? And it was pretty much it. We're a turnkey problem. We still do that today. That's our bread and butter, and that's what we like to do is this turnkey certifications. However, we do have a la carte services uh, because everyone in the industry right now is starting to bid that way, right? And so what do I mean? I mean, there's a few things in the certification process that are required, okay? And so if there's, if there's people out there that want to do their own FMEAs, want to do their own FMEDAs, want to do their own safety case, Maybe they want to you know, do their own architecture analysis, do their own threat modeling. Whatever these things may be, you can do those, and we'll only quote the mandatory thing. So uh, if you, if you want to do more of the work, we'll allow you. But we want to educate people to say, okay, you know, if you want us to do X, it'll be this cost, Y, it'll be this cost. And it's really nice because now you can pick and choose what you want to do. If you have more time on hand, you're kind of slow at work, maybe you want to do more of the work. If you want to lead, let us do it because we do it every single day, then we'll be more than happy to do it. We'll do that FMEDA. We'll run all of our software tools and we'll share with you uh, what we do on these tools and how we do it and, and you know, how do we refine them um, and we'll do things like that. But uh, so, yeah, that was another thing that that helps make us unique is we can we can offer everything. We can either do turnkey solutions, we can do a la carte solutions and anything that you may need a need for because our company only does this even if it we, it doesn't exist at the current time we can develop it create it and do that work because this is all we do we have the manpower and we only take on the jobs that we're able to successfully complete uh, and to date uh, we've been very very successful at it what are some of the unique services that we talked about um, that go beyond um, just the, the the standard ones that you've heard of. Well, one would be the site safety index. Another thing that no one else does is the calibrated FMEDA. So when you get an FMEDA done by us, it's actually calibrated. And then we also have software tools that basically do the work for you, which is super nice. And they're all reusable. So every time you do a project, you don't have to start from scratch anymore. It, it, it does everything for you, brings everything back up to speed. And one thing that I did, and I put on here, you know, this is actually more of a reminder for me, is that we do have a service list brochure that's like eight pages long of all the different things that we do. And many people don't know that this even exists. And what I decided to do, and I, I talked to my, um, I talked to Jatana Wasserman, she told me, hey, look, why don't we give this to everybody that joins this webinar and anybody that signed up for this webinar? So I'm going to do that. I'll, I'll go ahead and PDF a copy of it so everybody can have it. Uh, the morning session, a couple people were already asking for it as well. So uh, yeah, I, we're just going to go ahead and just give it to everybody and then you can do as you wish. So um, I thought that would be very useful. So let's talk about those first three things that we that we that we talked about. So like the site safety index, what is that? It's all based around that safety culture. And the site safety index is really a metrics that now puts assumptions in place for human factors. What we notice and what our advisory board was telling us is that hey, look, it's so great that we now have certified products, and it's so great that end users are now creating these safety systems. But what we're realizing is from plant to plant to plant, if you have multiple plants, they all have the same equipment. Why in the world are we still getting different failure rates? Why is one getting all their customers, or why, why is one site failing more than another site? And it's because there's other factors in place and it's a lot of these human factors. And what we say is, look, there's this human factor that it comes into play in these safety system performances, whether it's something breaks down and they don't fix it correctly, right? So you have the imperfect repair, then you have improper calibration, or maybe they don't calibrate the machines when they're supposed to, and there's the installations are, are wonky. And so there's a lot of things that we look into that contribute and they decrease the safety performances of, of or the functional safety performances. The good news, 
even if you don't have a budget right now, uh, there's a link on our website. If you want to uh, ask me, or maybe I'll put it, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try and find it and send it out to everybody. But there's a link where you can actually do your own assessment at a very top level approach. You can kind of get an idea, ask some, some simple questions, you go through it, you kind of figure out where your SSI level is, one, two, three, or four. And then it's kind of nice to see, okay, here's where I, we are. Where do we need to be? Do we want to just stay where we are or do we want to improve? You know, what's the level of risk are we willing to take? What is that top level risk? Or you can always have us come out, we'll come on site, we'll go to the different sites actually, and we'll perform this audit and you can see where your best plan is, where your worst plan is, where you need to make improvements, where you need to spend more of your time, because we all know that when something fails, we what we do what? Besides get a higher risk, we lose money too. So you don't want to keep losing money because you have a poor run poor run site, right? And, and things aren't done correctly. And those are some things that you want to get fixed. The next thing, I'll talk about this calibrated FMEDA. All right, why do we have a calibrated FMEDA? Why is just an FMEDA not good enough because what we realize is look not all fmedas are created equal anymore and there's a lot of fmedas that are using the wrong data because what we say is data good data in gets you good results if you have bad data in you're going to get bad results it's only as good as the failure rate in that database that you use that's it that's as good as that fmeda is going to be and what happened in 2016 uh, for IEC 61511, the standard, they came out with some really strong language that really reinforced what those reliable engineers have always understood. And they said, look, the reliability data used when quantifying the effect of random failure shall be, these four words are so strong. It says credible, traceable, documented, and justified. Oh, just, I mean, just think about that. You're, you're getting yourself certified in IEC 61508, your manufacturer, right? And then you get these failure rates. How do you know this database that this FMEDA was done on was creditable? How do you know, where's the traceability of those failure rates? Where did those failure rates come from? Was it from the right application, the industry, the right, uh, the right sector, right? Like, what are their failure rates from washing machines, right? And they said, oh, you know, that component in that washing machine failed for this reason. Was it a high demand component or was it a low demand component? How do we, how can we justify these numbers? And so that's what the Calibrate FMADA does, right? And I'll show you quickly in this slide here what it means and what we're doing when we do an FMEDA is we ask the manufacturer for their data, right? We want their returns and it's warranty returns, right? Why do we want warranty returns? Warranty returns mean that customer that purchased that product is more likely going to return it than if it's out of warranty. Right, so we want warranty return information. We'll take a look at that. Next thing we'll do, we'll get the industry databases that are out there, whether it's Orita, whether it's, uh, I think there's a Siemens one as well. And I just, there's another one that's really big too. Anyway, so we'll take all the industry databases and we'll compare those uh, to, to our database. Then we talk to the end users and we say, hey, how's those products working in the field? And we'll gather all those field uh failure rates okay so what do we do with all this information we start analyzing this information we gather this is this is the this is literally the backbone of exida this failure information is everything to us and it's where we invest the most time the most the money uh everything is we study failure rates and it sounds so nerdy and it so is and it's what we love <laughs> but it, it's it's what's going to create uh better predicted results when you have a new product you don't know how it's going to react having great data and having similar components that have already been tested and tried and true and we have failure rates on it you can now have a great uh prediction as to the reliability of that product and so what happens is as we go through this fmeda and as we update all these components as they change because some components get better over time some get uh Maybe they have more functions or they, they, they seem to be better on paper, but they actually become less reliable, right? Because some people out there are making products that they want to fail so that you come back to them and buy more. <laughs> so what we're doing is we're analyzing all this data, updating your database, you know, adjusting failure rates as they need to be adjusted. And then we, we look at the realistic failure rates compared to our predicted results and we make sure that they line up. If they don't line up, we have to make an adjustment because something is off, something is wrong. And we keep making these changes, we keep refining the database, and this is just an ongoing thing. As we do FMEDAs, we're always making sure that our predicted results are matching the actual results. And then one more piece of that is we have a website called Sill Safe Data, where you can now see 
uh, ranges where you should expect to see failure rates fall for those types of products. We did this so that if someone goes and get an FMEDA done and it falls outside of this limit, we say take it back, return it, ask for a new one kind of thing because that, that FMEDA is not accurate. It's either way conservative or it's way too optimistic because the range that we give is a very big range and there's no reason at all it should fall outside of that scope unless they did something wrong. And so that's something as a safety check for you that if you do get an FMEDA done and it does not fall in that range, you seriously need to reconsider that. Or maybe there's some reason uh, for it to be outside of range, right? I don't know that either, but um, that's just at least something, a sanity check. Now, if we could circle back to the standard and, and when we talk about this, this FMEDA, this calibrated FMEDA, creditable, why? Because we now have publicly available detailed descriptions of the method, okay? We told everyone, we, we have no secrets on how this is done. The results are within the field failure. We, we fell within a 90% confidence limit. That's how we are creditable. Traceable, every single record is kept for field failure data. We have everything, okay? All the calculations are done. We have even published a white paper that you see right there below on this uh, information. It's documented why we have publicly, we have books that you can purchase with all these failure rates within it. Now, I personally like uh, Excellentia, right? Because the databases within there are Silstat, right? Because that database is already in there and it, it updates quarterly. So I all, we're always getting the latest and greatest or our customers are always getting it if they have that database. And of course, justified why? Because we compare predicted results with the actual results that we see in the field and everything lines up and we even line up with other industry standards or industry databases as well. So that's how we meet that standard. I challenge other uh, companies if they have their own failure rates that they're using. I challenge them saying, hey, look, can you meet the requirement of 6511, the 2016 version? And more than likely, they will have to say no. They, they do not have the records behind there unless they're using a database that has been doing their due diligence. Um, we do have very easy to use, best in class tools. This is another reason that separates us from uh, most other competitors. Because we have this software, it ensures uh, that we're compliant with all the standards. We don't miss anything. All of our customers now can use these tools and really we can back away and do other work. Work that's more challenging, work that maybe less people want to do. We love doing that stuff. So we'd rather give you all the tools, let you be successful, whether you're doing a PHA, a LOPA, if you're doing SIL selection, if you're doing your own SRS, uh, SIL alarm, cybersecurity, right? Cyberfax, whatever the tool is, we want to give you the power to do it so you don't have to, you, you can do it internally, right? That's the whole objective is how can we get our manufacturer, our users that want to use this information, how can we train them to get them to do what we do so we can start doing other things, right? And raise that bar even more, really get safer plants so that we can minimize all incidences that are out there. Real quick fun slide about Excellentia. It just kind of reiterates the, the suite of, of how we have that complete life cycle. Right, where you, you, we have uh, four different tools that do on your analysis phase of the life cycle. When you get to design and implementation, you know we have another three or four tools, and we have another three or four tools that when you get to the operation and maintenance side, that helps, and it's a, it's a living thing. And what's so nice is that because it's all within one, they all coexist with each other. So this is what you're seeing in front of you with all the tools that an end user would use, but we also have tools that are for OEMs as well, right? So ArcX, what is that? Well, that, that allows designers and independent evaluators to analyze at a high level uh, design architecture for safety, uh, for availability, along with all the different types of cyber vulnerabilities, all right? Don't be someone that says, yeah, we know cyber is out there, but uh, yeah, we're just worried about functional safety. No, you got to start worrying about cybersecurity, especially if it talks. Even if it doesn't talk to anything, if your product can get plugged into something that will eventually talk to something, guess what? It could, there could be something on your product that goes to someone that can talk to, to an internet, and now all of a sudden you just impacted everything, right? And there's a lot of different stories that we can share, but that now is not the time, but uh, <laughs> let's get back to ArcX because that's when you're designing your product. Why not use something that has this expert knowledge inside it that says, hey, look, um, here's a deviation. What are the mitigating factors for it? 
You know, how can we resolve that? And when you go into like a tool like this, anytime we learn something on how you can solve that problem, we put it in this tool. And so you can have a tool, you can have a, a deviation and it says, okay, there's six ways that we've seen solved and you can select which way you'd like to do it. And then you can kind of go through it. You can figure out with this ArcX tool where your weakest links are in that design so that before you actually design it, you already know it's going to be uh, still capable. Right, or you can at least minimize most of those failure rates so that you can now uh, design a safer, more robust, more reliable product. Then after you do the ArcX tool, we then use uh, an FMEDA X tool, right? And what this tool does is this is where um, you, you perform, you document this detail component level. This is for your failure rates. This, this helps share with you um, all the different failure modes, whether it's fail safe, fail dangerous, if it's detected, if it's undetected. And what's really nice about this for me, the X tool is that it uses that X to the EMCRH component database, right? EMCRH is your, uh, your, your component database, the book and stuff. But it, we use that X to the component database that has all those billions of hours in it. And it, when that keeps updating, the Femida X tool also uses that as well. So it's really nice. All right, let's keep moving here. So another thing that's really unique about about our company that uh, we we're, we really pride ourselves with that we're actually really bad at talking about <laughs> is that once we go through and we do work for someone, our the proposal stops there, but our work doesn't, right? We still <laughs> I like I like the bunny. Uh, we we keep going, right? And, and it's because we don't once we say okay, congratulations, you now if you're a manufacturer, you now have a sil two capable product. Great job on your pressure transmitter. Great job on your valve. Or you know maybe we're working on the new the latest thing, which is integrating valves and actuators together, right? Uh, that's another conversation as well. But we don't stop there. We give you a certificate, but our work isn't done yet. We still have to keep working for you. And when I mean we have to keep working is because there's so much more that we do behind the scenes for you to help optimize uh, your the work that we just did for you. One of the things that we did is we have this website called S A E L, the safety automation equipment list. It's awesome. Why I say it's awesome is because if you're an end user, you now have the, <laughs> it's kind of like you now have the Amazon of functional safety and cybersecurity, or you now have this this place that you can go to and start buying things. If you're a manufacturer, guess what? You now get listed on this site. So now all these manufacturers that need a SIL2 pressure transmitter or SIL3 pressure transmitter, they can go here and say, oh, look, there's there's 10 here. Which one do I want? Which features do I need? Boom, click, and it goes right to their page, and you can then buy it from that manufacturer. It's awesome. And so that's what this SAEL website was. Why was it created? Actually, it was created because we wanted to keep track of what price we certified. Then we didn't realize, but hey, guess what? And users would love this because now why? They have access to knowing where all the certified equipment is um, that they can now purchase. And 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 then the, the assessment reports on there, the certificates on there, so they know the failure rates right away, right? So they know if the risk reduction factor, what that is, what what SIL rating they need, they can get all the failure rates, they can calculate it all, they can put into Excellentia, and they can run with it, right? So even before they buy it, they can figure out if your product is right for them which is so nice. And we do the same thing now with cybersecurity. There's two parts. There's a, there's a functional safety click, or you can have a cybersecurity click, and you can see all the products that are already getting cybersecurity certified. Um, what is that? Yeah, right here. See that? So you can now click to see where you need to go, and it's your, it's your secure shopping cart for your customers. And it's super cool. Um, but that is something that no one else does. Another thing that we do that we don't really even talk about is we have safety awards. I'm not sure if you if if you've realized that we do this, but every year uh, our a group gets together and we say, okay, hey, what did we certify that was innovative? What did we certify that uh, was unique? And people are winning safety awards. Um, and this goes beyond that whole proposal that we talked about at the beginning, right? This is these are just these extras that we do because we want to recognize greatness and we want that to continue. We want people to become safer because that's why we're here. Nobody's coming uh, to us saying, "I just want to get the certificate." You know, no, they want they have a reason. They want to become better. They want to become safer. They want to create less shutdowns. They want you know to become more reliable. Why? Because it all comes down to money too, right? Uh, just just think of how expensive a, a catastrophe is if uh, you could have prevented it, if you, if you could have had the right system in place. Um, another thing that we do, this was not so unique. Okay, I'll give, I'll, I'll give everyone that. 
uh, there are companies that do news releases. We love doing news releases. Every time we do anything, we want to make sure people know about uh, how great a company was when they got their product certified. So we do all kinds of news releases on all the different platforms. We do publications where, where, where groups with all these different types of publications. So anytime that we write articles, which is a lot of the time, uh, with, with our customer's permission, we'll include them, we'll include their products, we'll get their products, we'll get logos. We put logos all inside all of our books, right? So if you have a product that you'd like to get in one of our publications that we're working on, you know, we'll either reach out to you, you reach out to us if you're interested, and, and we'll see what we can do. But we do a lot more that we never talk about, and we have nonstop research. The, and what we why we say that is because yeah we're we're a technical expert this is what we do we're we're those nerds that I talk about and nerds is such a positive thing in my eyes and because we publish everything we're an open book there's nothing that we do that that nobody can learn how to do if they want to do it and if we remain this open book and we publish everything guess what that actually does it 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 solves Dr. Goebbels uh initiative his goal and his goal was what his goal was hey look people are trying to get product certified and they can't get them certified because nobody's helping them because they're saying it can't be done what we realize is if something is published it is now common knowledge it's now available to everybody so you're not giving anyone a competitive advantage so when people come to us and they say hey look you know we want to get this we want we need this service or we want this certified or hey we need some help in cybersecurity because we've published everything we now can help you in that term we can now go to the say hey look chapter 15 of this book read that chapter that's what you need to know and it's so refreshing to have something to be able to watch people figure things out now it's no more sorry you got to come back read the standard again i've read the standard. no read the standard again sorry we can't help you now exa can help people and that's one of the value that's almost priceless is now you never get stuck you never just can't do it the only reason you stop a project is if you don't feel like correcting the action item that was given <laughs> so and and, and and put everything aside with buying books or publications you know because people say i don't have the funding well you don't have that excuse anymore there's well over 100 different webinars out there on our youtube channel that you can just listen to this one will be another one that goes on there um, we have over 30 white papers that you don't have to pay anything for and so there's a lot of information out there that won't cost anything that people need to take advantage of um, because why it's because we we all need we, we want people to learn faster so we can start doing other things right i think the latest white paper we had it was really nice it was it was done on the comparison between the functional safety process and the cybersecurity process right which was uh iec 62443 uh 4-1 one of that standard is for uh the process of cybersecurity What's great about that white paper? Well, guess what? If, if you're doing functional safety and you're thinking about cybersecurity, read this white paper because this white paper actually shows you the overlap in the process of cybersecurity and functional safety. It's really cool uh, what we did there. And there's so much other stuff that you that you could learn. Um, it's, it's almost endless. So what I want to leave you with, and, and I'll open up to questions, I promise, is that, look, at the very least, um, at least join one of these platforms, right? And why I say join platform is because at least you'll see what's going on. You'll see what the latest stuff that we're working on is, um, and you can uh, you can grasp that at least, right? And it, it doesn't take much to join one of those things. I say just do it. If you want to ask about topics, hey, I'd love for you guys to talk about this. Send it to academy at exeter.com. Uh, we'll we'll put it in the list and we'll start working through it because we do one a week, almost two a week now. Um, okay, so training. When you take a look at these classes, normally we just kind of fly through this slide, right? Because like, oh yeah, it's training, it's on the website, figure it out. But no, here's the thing. When you look at these classes, remember, ignorance is not an excuse. Too many times, you know, we're called out to a plant and then just an engineer will say, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> be proactive, don't be reactive. You know, you're always so much further ahead in the long run. Uh, you know, sharpen that ax before you cut a tree down, they, things like this. And besides the trainings, as I mentioned before, there's hundreds of webinars, white papers. There are no cost to you. So start learning, start educating yourself, especially if you're holding a position of cybersecurity personnel or functional safety. Uh, I mean, we've even, we're even working with companies say, you know, hey, Ted, this is all well and good. These classes are great. Um, but, you know, we don't have the time for this. 
uh, we we have to we we have our own training programs already set up. Great, because what we also do is we also work with those companies. We create custom courses just for those companies, and then they incorporate those trainings within their training program. So any existing companies. Are, employees there's a yearly thing that they have to watch right on functional safety or cybersecurity, and then all their new hires have different trainings that are more in depth that they have to watch and so there's so many things that we do we don't really advertise it that's why it's valuable for you to be on this call or, or on this this thing here share this with your management as well to let people know that this exists we have online training why is online training well that's just the new thing that people are doing, right? I guess like two years ago, what we found out is people's traveling budgets were getting cut. They said, we need this training, but we can't come to these facilities. We can't come to these areas. So uh, once again, our training coordinator, uh, Jatana, she got with our team and she put everything together, right? Now we have all these online trainings and there's more and more coming out. Uh, so if there's a training that you need to have online, let us know. Maybe we'll bump that to the top of the list. But so that was the webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Let's get to these questions. I hope this was valuable for you. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Like I said, it's a uh, it's a lot of work here, <laughs> but it's rewarding. We we love we love helping people, and I think that's the the name of the game here. All right, let me go to these questions. All right, let me pull it up. All right, so the first question I have. We recently received three different proposals and all three were vastly different. How does this happen? <laughs> okay, well, all right. So I don't know what who the companies were, obviously, but if, if I were to say anything to you, if I were in your shoes, okay, go back to those companies and really just ask for specifics, okay? So what, what would that be? Say, hey, you know, of this proposal, what do you require from me? How many man hours do you think it will take for me to do whatever you're asking me to do? That's the first thing, right? Because all proposals are different. Ask them, what are the deliverables? Okay, what what amount of work are they going to be doing? What don't you have to do? That's another question I would ask. Uh, are they accredited? We went over why that's important, right? Because if they're not accredited, then you're going to have a hard time getting whatever work you get done justified. So if someone wants to see your report on how you have that information, if you don't have an accredited source, it's, you know, it's going to be that much harder. Uh, how long has the company been around? I'd probably say, I'd probably ask for their CVs and then ask for recommendations or what previous work they've already done so that you can make sure that they know what they're doing and they have history of doing it before. Uh, because the other thing is, sure, those proposals might be all vastly different, but let's be honest, you get what you pay for, especially in, the, in this industry. All right, another question. Um, we're starting to hear more about cybersecurity. What do you recommend for a company just getting started? Good question. Uh, what I recommend, actually what we, we, we do all the time here now, and I think it's one of the most common things because a lot of people are in your shoes, is to do a cyber gap assessment, whether you're an end user, whether you're a manufacturer, uh, the assessment's slightly different, but it's this, we call it kind of the same. Do that cyber gap assessment, really figure out at least where your starting point is, and then we can probably do uh, more of a pragmatic approach, really, because uh, if you're an end user, you're gonna wanna know, well, here's my budget, what can we get done for this amount, right? And you just say, or here's here's the level of risk we just discovered from that gap assessment. Here are the things that, here's our roadmap, right? And we'll put a roadmap in place saying, okay, throughout these next three years, here are the things that we're gonna get accomplished. You know, every Q1, we're gonna do another thing. And so that's what I would recommend is really just get that starting block, get a cyber gap assessment, get that figured out where you, you stand, where you need to be. If you're a manufacturer or an integrator, there's different things called security levels. A lot of people go on security level one, security level two, and uh, it's really, you know, what level of risk are you willing to accept? Uh, because it's not when, um, but it, it's not if, it's when, right? So it's gonna happen. Cybersecurity is not going away. It's actually growing faster than functional safety, and there's there's huge impacts with it. Good question. Next thing. Uh, we never see, <laughs> we, I see this one a lot. We never seem to have funding for cyber activities. <laughs> All right, well, not to be too straightforward, but look, I recommend you take a look at what could happen to whatever you have. Is a product, is it a system, but whatever that safety system, what would happen if you lost control of it, 
is really what I ask people. Or what happens in your plan if an outside source could turn on and off valves and it had access to your system? Regardless of how hard you think it is for someone to actually do that, even if it's not connected to the internet, there's ways to get uh, to get uh, hacked, right? And and I can share those ways later. But just just think of that. If an accident were to occur, whether it was by functional safety means or cybersecurity means, all of a sudden that upfront cost, right? That budget that you can't get, <laughs> it really doesn't compare to what it would cost if something were to happen or a disaster were to happen at that site. Um, I mean, that, that's just kind of the bottom line. So if you're talking to management, you sound like you might be some kind of a, maybe a technical engineer or someone that can't really control where funding goes. Share, I mean, you can even share this webinar with them. Say, look, this, these, this is what happens. This is what was said. And I mean, if, if you want, you can even email me and I can give you some things, um, some, some talking points at least if you would like. But uh, that's really it. I mean, that cost compared to what could happen, you got to really put that on your own feet and say, look, is it worth it? Are we willing to accept it if this were to happen? And, and that's what you got to look at. So it's not going away. Like I said, we're seeing this more and more. My biggest thing is just get a gap assessment, figure out where you stand, because I think that's everyone's starting block. All right. Those were all my questions. Hey, thanks so much, everyone, for joining today's webinar. I really greatly appreciate that. I hope you enjoyed it. I try to throw some humor in there, too. So uh, have a great day. Take care. Thanks again. We'll chat soon. Bye-bye.